Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome back to our second Friday series. And this month we are hosting our Romir Bearden Overlapping Meetings series. Um, my name is Sasha Giordano. I am the Assistant Director at the Hofstra University Museum of Art. And before I begin, I just want to remind you to please have your microphones on mute. Um, you can by all means ask questions in the chat and comments and you can kind of put them in there and we will address them all at the end of the presentation. So you can go ahead and ask your questions as things come up. Um, in the chat, if you notice, there is a book list posted for you. The Hempstead Library very generously made that list for us. So if you want further reading about Romeo Bearden, that's there for you. And then there's also a flyer about our series, um, our, our um, event for next week, which is a family art activity. And on that flyer, you can see the supply list. So you might wanna start gathering that during the week. Um, lastly, this session is being recorded. And I know a question had just come up in the chat already. Um, we are recording these and the first one is already available on our website. And you can find that on the calendar of events page. So um, just stay tuned, more will be coming. Oh, sorry. So um, as I mentioned, this is our Romir Bearden overlapping meanings uh, in depth look at the artist and his work. It's a virtual program. It consists of five sessions and this is the third in that series. It's from, um, it will continue on through March 4th. And you can use the same Zoom link each Friday and we will send you a reminder email, uh, you know, so that you have a little note that, to, you know, come in and make sure that you tune in on us um, for the next two Fridays. So you can see that listed here. Today, we have an exciting event for you. We are going live to New York City. We are going to the EFA Robert Blackburn Studio in New York City. And you're going to be able to experience a virtual printmaking demonstration. So um, the studio will, in addition to kind of bringing you into their space and, and doing this hands-on demonstration, they'll also explain a little bit about the history of Robert Blackburn and Romero Bearden and a bit about their collaboration. So today, as I said, we bring ourselves and we bring you into New York City. You can see um, the location on 39th Street. And we're very happy to hand you over to Justin Sands, who is the workshop manager and the master printer, and Elsie Klempner, who is the programming and exhibitions manager. And they'll be taking over for the rest of today's session. So we thank them for joining us and we're really excited to kind of get this in-depth look on the printmaking process. So Justin, I'm going ahead, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and then uh, please go ahead and start. Great. Thank you, Sasha. All right. So I'm just gonna start by explaining. Um, the workshop a little bit. Um, so the print shop is a community print shop on West 39th Street. This is a photo from one of our open houses in 2019. And so we have uh, facilities to, for all traditional printmaking techniques. And some of the ones that Romer Bearden used are lithography, which we're gonna do a demonstration today in traditional stone lithography. But the basic principle of lithography is that grease and water repel each other on the plate and then as long as you keep the plate wet when you're sponging it then it will um, repel the ink in those blank areas and then take ink wherever you draw with a pencil but you'll see that in much more detail later and then there's also um, collagraph is another technique that Bearden used and so that process involves using a, a textured plate where you would either glue um, you would glue some kind of textured object to a backing plate and then ink it and run it through the press. So this is um, a, a collagraph that's by an artist named Cullen Washington being printed by some of our printers. And so he also used etching. So this is um, an intaglio technique. And so etching is where you actually incise the image into a copper plate um, or a zinc plate. And then wherever the 
um, wherever your drawing is or wherever the photograph is, it's actually etched into the plate and then you rub ink across the entire surface of the plate and buff it clean so that the ink only remains in the incised lines. <clears throat> and then he also used silk screen. So silk screen is a process where you can photographically put an image onto a screen and then wherever you place the, whatever you place underneath it, whether it be paper or um, fabric, then you can squeegee. It's just a photographic way of making a stencil in the screen and whatever you put under there, you can print onto. So these are just some of the techniques that Romare Bearden used. Um, in the workshop, we also have classes and residencies as well as a gallery. Um, so if you want to look, if you want to look into that more, you can look at our website. Um, it's uh, if you just Google RBPMW or Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, or we can put it in the chat. Also, you can read more about the printmaking workshop. Um, so the workshop is in the name of Robert Blackburn, and he's a famous printmaker who lived from 1920 until 2003. And within that time, he changed printmaking history and art history as we know it. And one of the ways that he did that is by um, introducing Romare Bearden, or well, helping Romare Bearden create some of his first editions. And then he eventually went on to make over 100 editions of prints and all those different techniques. Um, Robert Blackburn is most famous for his developments in stone lithography, which is what we're going to go over today. And these are some of his own prints, some of Robert Blackburn's prints. So one of the things about stone lithography is that every color that you see here was drawn on a separate stone. So each color was on a separate stone and then you have to register the paper so that all of the colors line up where you want it to. And so when Robert Blackburn made these prints in the 60s, there was no American artist that was making lithographs of this complexity. Um, some of his prints would you know, use up to 18 different stones. And so then he also started his famous printmaking workshop in 1948, to which we're a continuation and helped thousands of artists throughout his career. Um, and his generosity was world renowned. You know, he was always about helping other artists and giving back to his community as well. So this is a photo of him and Romare Bearden um, working on some of their prints. And so there's a lot of similarities um, Blackburn and Bearden were both, um, they both grew up in Harlem. They both went to the same um, high school, DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. And then, and then they continued to um, go on to learn um, printmaking and other art um, practices in the Harlem Community Arts Center and the um, Art Students League also. And so this is them working on some of their it's a print together, and this is the print here. So um, this print is an etching. So they used um, a process called photogravure to transfer um, photographic imagery onto the plate. And then every color would be printed in a separate plate that you see there. So this was originally etched into either a copper or zinc plate and then you know, wherever the different colors are, there would be a separate plate that only had that area etched. And then it would be printed all together on the same piece of paper. And so this is the same process here, um, color etching. And then these are some of his lithographs. So, for these lithographs, he was either drawing directly onto a stone to make each color, or the there's newer developments in lithography also where you can paint onto films and then expose them photographically onto different plates. Um, but we still make prints where every, every color is on a separate plate. So in order to get this print, he would have had to, you know, they would have had to print um, you know, maybe there's 15 colors on this or something like that. And similar to, to this one. And so Romero Bearden would have worked with Blackburn as a printer. 
Um, so something that we still do today is where there's artists that don't necessarily have the technical expertise to make prints. So then they would get paired with a printer and collaborate on um, prints together. So it would be like the printer was the one doing the actual rolling and the inking that you're gonna be seeing in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, so then, you know, this, this print has over 20 colors. So that would mean, you know, 20 different plates to create this. And so the, the process of inking and printing the plate is the same as what we're about to do now with the stone, um, but it's a little bit faster. So what we're gonna do today is show you traditional stone lithography. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the, the stone lithocam in the workshop here, and we're gonna go to Essie. Hi, and thank you, Lucia Martinez, who's recording right now. <laughs> All right. So this is our graining yeah. sink. So with um, traditional stone lithography, you can grain the stone, like your image is all on the surface. So then when you want to remove your image and start with another image, you can grain the stone. So a lot of the stones that we have are Robert Blackburn's stones um, that he used in his original workshop. And so what Essie's doing is she's using a levigator and carborundum, which is metal filings. And she's spinning the levigator on the surface of the stone to grain it away. Um, so this is how we erase the image on the stone and we can reuse the stones again and again. Um, typically the stones used in lithography are limestone and then it all has to be completely flat um, in order to get a print because if there's any low parts in the stone then that won't print because it won't get as much pressure. Um, and then Essie is also filing the edges. So, you know, there's a lot of labor that goes into traditional stone lithography, which is what Bearden would have used um, in the beginning of his printmaking career. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of different things that we have to do to go over, you know, to make the stone completely flat. And you have to make sure that the image is gone because you're needing to remove the grease because there's a trace of grease in the in the stone that has to be removed. And then, so we're in the workshop now. And um, this is a stone that SE has been drawing on. And so these are some of the drawing materials. So it, these are um, litho, there's special litho crayons and litho pencils, and they come in different hardnesses. So there's different numbers on them. The one that she's holding is a number one, which is softer and you can get darker tones. And then that's a number four, which is a little harder and you can get the lighter tones and the lighter grays. And, you know, they're similar to charcoal pencils. So you can see the different tones when she draws on it like that. And so now Essie's gonna, she, so she's, this is one of her drawings. So she's gonna continue working on it here. And so it's a special kind of pencil um, that's also called a grease pencil. And so what's happening when Essie draws on the stone is that the grease pencil clogs the pores of the stone with the grease. So everywhere that she's drawing, you know, the, the stone is open in that center frame there. And everywhere that she's drawing is clogging the pores of the stone with grease there. And yeah, a lot of artists have to put a piece of paper up like that so that your hand doesn't smudge the drawing, um, but also the grease from your hand can also transfer um, into the stone. So she's, given a, she's doing a fingerprint, so we'll see if that comes up. Um, so then you can also, you know, it's a really great medium because you can also scratch away um, after you've drawn. So you can actually carve into the stone to remove some of the drawing material. And then that'll, unclog the, the pores of the stone with grease. All right. Yeah, so once the, the artist is done drawing on the stone and their drawing is finished, then they can start to process the stone. So 
Um, Essie is going to be using rosin and talc. So this is the the rosin over here, um, which is a distilled tree sap, and then talc, which is you know just similar talc that you would use um, you know for toiletries and whatnot. So it, the talc is in a powder, and she is spreading it across the stone. And the purpose of, or sorry, the, the rosin. So she's spreading the rosin across the stone. And one of the properties of rosin is that it's a acid resist. So the rosin is sticking to anywhere that the grease pencil is drawn and making it a little more acid resistant because Essie's gonna be etching the stone with acid and gum arabic. And one of the risks when you're etching a stone is if it's too acidic, it can actually burn away your image. So by using the rosin, it adheres to the grease pencil and makes it a little more resistant to the acid. And that's the same kind of rosin you would use if, you're, if you've ever done violin and you rosin a bow, it's, a very, it's the same thing. Um, and then she's going to use some talc, which helps to dry the drawing material. So she's now going to spread talc across the whole stone. And so that helps to dry it so that when she rubs the gum arabic and the acid across the stone that it doesn't smudge the drawing. Because right now in the stone, the light gray parts that you have here are open stone, so that's bare stone. And then the, um, the border is gum arabic that she previously painted on the stone to protect the borders from any grease. Because the whole process is based on grease and water repelling each other. So now what Essie has to do is she's going to be taking gum arabic and um, nitric acid so a mixture of gum arabic and nitric acid to clog the open pores of the stone with gum arabic. So she has her, it's called etching the stone. So she's actually using the nitric dropper to put nitric acid into the gum arabic there. And so, the, so that's a three drop etch. Um, so there's different strengths of acid that you would do for different um, drawing materials, but Essie's going to do a general um, three drop etch today. Or it looks like she might be mixing another one. A five, oh, she's going to do a five drop at <laughs> five drop one, two. No, okay, she's not. <laughs> I mixed the five drop before class. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, I see, I see. Yeah, so there, there's different, um, you know, if you, if you draw, um, lighter than it has to have a lighter etch and if you draw darker than it has to have a heavier etch and so she's going to start by um, pouring the gum arabic and uh, acid mixture and this is regular gum I just poured it in this cup here but it's regular gum okay. no acid this one. right <laughs> yeah so she's going to pour the gum over the whole stone so at this point any part that's open that isn't clogged by the grease of the drawing material is now getting clogged with the gum arabic. And so she's making sure to um, keep it moving so it doesn't dry out and covering the whole stone with the gum. And then at this point, she's gonna use the acid mixture and she's gonna start painting that into her drawing material. So the, the purpose of the acid is to create a stronger bond between the gum and the stone. And it's something that's called a, a gum adsorb film. So the, the gum adsorb, adsorb film is what protects the blank parts of the stone from picking up ink. And so the acid helps to bond the gum in those areas but you can't leave it on there for too long because it could burn out your image. So she has to cool it down with some regular gum Arabic. And so this is the same gum Arabic that's also in your food as well. Um, it's just a, you know, there's, if you look in the ingredients list on a lot of different um, foods, there's gum Arabic on there. And so after she cooled it down, now she's gonna be, she's buffing 
the gum arabic into the surface of the stone because you don't want to leave a you don't you can't have any large chunks behind um so she's using cheesecloth to buff the gum arabic into the stone so that it's a nice thin film and a fresh cheesecloth and you have to buff it pretty well so it's only a, a very thin layer of gum arabic so the idea is that the the greasy drawing material after this will be removed and the gum arabic will stay behind so the um even though the drawing material will be removed it'll still leave behind um, a grease residue um, so she has to buff it in a very thin layer until it's completely dry. And so this is what's called a first etch. Um, and this is like a, you know, quite quick version of it. Um, you know, if you, if you were printing a long edition, then we would have to, we would do two etches, but for demonstration purposes, we're only going to do one etch. But if you want the stone to last up to, you know, you can do like a hundred prints from one stone, you would want to do a second etch. So you would use the acid a, a second time. So after you remove the drawing material, then you would um, replace it with ink, which is what Essie's gonna do shortly. Um, but then you would etch it again. So now um, this, is where, this is where the magic happens. So Essie's gonna use uh, lithotene which is a greasy solvent to remove the drawing material. Um, so this solvent is only used for removing the drawing material. And yeah, good thing she's wearing gloves because it is a toxic, <laughs> a toxic solvent. And so now she's using the solvent to remove the drawing material. So that gum Arabic film that she buffed in before is still present on the blank part or on the parts that doesn't don't have the drawing material and although she's cleaning off the drawing material it still has grease left behind um, in those areas so you can see the trace of the drawing and the grease left behind on the stone and the lighter parts of the stone still have that gum arabic layer and so now she's going to use asphaltum um, which is a mine tar to um, rub asphaltum across the whole stone and protect the grease and add it by adding a, a, an even layer of grease to it. So the, the asphaltum will now stick to the areas that have the grease reservoir um, from the drawing material. And that just gives it a nice even grease deposit where the drawing is done. And then she also has to buff that down. And this also has to be um, completely dry before she removes this. So, you know, the, the stones are grained and, and the graining sink, they can be grained to a very fine grit. So the surface of the stone is very smooth. And then that's how you can get all the detail and tonality from lithographs because you can grain the stone so it has very fine pores and then you can etch every one of the little pores of the stone to either want to take ink or to repel ink by either applying grease or the gum arabic because grease wants to attract more grease and gum arabic wants to repel grease and wants to attract water so when um, the printing happens you have to keep the stone wet the entire time because um, the water protects the blank parts of the, the stone but it were it um separates away from the area where the grease is where the greasy um, drawing material is and so she's using a fan right now to make sure it's completely dry because at this stage it has to be completely dry um, this might even be a good point to if there's any questions in the chat at this point um, if anyone has any, well, Essie's drawing the stone.
Maybe no questions in the chat. <laughs> okay. All right. So the um, the next step that Essie is going to do is she's going to use water to remove the asphaltum film, and so this is going to remove the asphaltum from the areas that have the gum arabic, but the asphaltum will still be left behind where the drawing material was. So you can see it cleaning off the gum film from the blank parts of the stone. And so now, um, at this point, we have to keep the stone wet um, because the water, so she's using a sponge and water. Um, the water is the only thing that protects the blank parts of the stone from inking up. So now Essie's gonna sponge the stone. You also wanna make sure you use a very thin layer of water um, because the, if you use too much water, it can get into your ink. Um, so yeah, so sponging is also a whole other process and a whole other thing to learn. Um, so then over here on the slab next to the stone is a roller with ink. Um, so this is specifically lithographic ink. And so Essie's warming it up because when it comes out of the can, it's quite stiff, but then you can warm it up to make it thinner. That's a, it's Gamblin um, is the company that makes that ink. And then there's also, she has a mixture of um, Gamblin and Charbonnel ink. So she has a pile that she's gonna add some ink to her slab here and then roll it up with a leather roller. So, you know, it's also an art in itself, the rolling and evening out the slab. Um, you have to make sure that the ink is completely even on the roller. So she's making sure it's really even on the slab before she goes over to the stone to start inking it. Um, somebody asked, in the chat if Bearden personally did any of this work. Um, he may have done some of it on his own, but I think I'm pretty sure he worked with a lot of printers um, to create his imagery. So he, you know, he did the, he would do the drawing part of it, but then this labor part would most likely be done by a, a printer. Although he did like experiment on his own collagraphs and everything, but I, I do know some printers that used to work with Bearden. Um, so now Essie's sponging the stone now that she has enough ink on her roller. And so she has to, you know, keep the stone wet. And then as soon as the sponge comes off, she's going to start rolling. And so you can see the ink is only sticking to the areas where the drawing material is and it's getting slowly getting darker. And so then now this process is just done um, repeatedly until there's enough ink on the stone. So then she has to go back to the slab and pick up more ink on the slab and then come back to the stone for another pass. So every time you have to make sure that the stone is wet and it's not drying out and then put another pass on it. And so the ink will only stick to wherever the grease is and the gum arabic layer and water will repel the drawing material i mean it will repel the ink so you know when when bearden would make these multicolor lithographs there would have to be one a stone on it with every separate color uh oh <laughs> and um you know because this the drawing can be inked up in any color after it's drawn on this and etched onto the stone. So if you were to put, um, you know, red ink on the on the roller and roll across it, then it would only then it would just um, take up red ink. So on all those lithographs, there needs to be a separate stone or a plate with each of the um, areas to be inked in different colors. So that means, you know, for 
like if it's a stone lithograph that has, you know, 20 colors and there has to be 20 stones. Um, although nowadays we use a lot of plates because it's a little quicker and there's photographic lithography. Um, yeah, so when we're doing additioning, you know, typically we would count the amount of passes and that's how you can maintain um, an addition that each print looks similar because you're counting the number of times that you roll on it and trying to maintain the same amount of ink on your slab. And so now Essie um, believes that her, her stone is inked up enough. Um, and so she's gonna print a proof first to see how it looks. So she's uh, using the fan to dry it out because you don't want the, the water from the stone can stretch your paper and give you all types of marks and whatnot on the paper. Um, yeah, so you know you just have to build up the proper amount of ink on the stone, and you can see like all those little, all the different tones on there, because all the little pores of the stone are etched um, and clogged with that, the grease from the grease pencil. And so now she's putting a piece of paper down. Um, so these are newsprint. This is newsprint paper, and um, this is called a tympan. So the the tympan is a piece of plastic that the scraper bar will glide on to print through the press. And this is a, a traditional lithographic press here that Essie's using. And she's gonna run it, start putting it, feeding it into the press here. And she's engaging the press down there. And then when she starts cranking, it'll move the bed through. And then at this point, she has to bring down um, the bar to test the pressure. And then she's also spreading ink across because the, the tympan needs enough grease to, um, to lubricate the scraper bar running across as it's printing. <laughs> so it is special grease. And now as he's running it through the press, so we just have to go in one direction. And although it doesn't look like it, these presses do have thousands of pounds of pressure. Um, and now she's lifting up the bar and scraping the grease back so she can continue and make another print. And so that looks pretty good for a first print. Yeah. So yeah, typically you would keep going on newsprint. Um, oh yeah, it's all Essie's pointing to her initials there um, because you also have to draw backwards because everything's in uh, on the stone. It, you know, it's backwards. It's a mirror image when you print. So you, if you do any text, you have to write backwards on there. Um, yeah, but typically you would keep going with newsprint until it looked dark enough for the good paper. And then once it's it's dark enough for the good paper, then you would switch to good paper. Um, so yeah, so if you know you see any prints and there's an addition of 20 or something, that means that this process of inking, um, sponging and inking had to be done, you know, to get enough ink on the stone and then that they had to do this 20 times, like 20 times through the press. And if it's a 15 color lithograph and an addition of 20, then that means that the piece of paper had to go through the press, you know, what is that, 400 times? <laughs> and so then, yeah, for the next print, now she has to keep sponging and inking. So for every print, you have to rebuild up the amount of ink that was on the stone. Um, because when you print it, it removes some of the ink from the stone. So for every print, she has to sponge to keep the blank parts of the stone clean and so that the water protects the blank parts of the stone. And then when she rolls across, across, it'll only pick up 
ink in the areas that you drew with the grease pencil. Um, so, you know, a lot of um, Bearden's lithographs would be photographically transferred onto the stone um, as well as drawn. So there's different processes that you can do to transfer a photographic image onto a stone and then you would etch it the same way and ink it the same way. It would just be instead of drawing, you would use a solvent to either transfer an image or um, another chemical. And so Essie's also changing direction when she rolls um, so that the, the pores of the stone get the ink on them in different directions and gives it a more rich print. And it's, you know, it's very important that the amount of ink is very even because if you only ink up one side of this stone, then you'll have, you know, it'll be darker on one side than another. Um, somebody in the chat said it must be exhausting to do a print with 20 or more plates. Um, yeah, typically, you know, you would do, if you do like an addition of 20, maybe you do like one or two colors a day, that kind of thing. So, you know, you just because if you're doing an addition of 20, then it would take you all day to print one color, depending on how large it is. Because then the larger, you know, if you imagine the larger prints need larger stones, so that makes everything more labor intensive, more expensive, because you have to, you know, buy bigger paper, grain larger stones, um, use a, you know, use a larger press, that kind of thing. But a lot of the newer developments in litho have made it so that you don't have to grain the stone anymore. Um, you can buy like a ball grain plate that's alum an aluminum plate that has uh, the texture of the, the stone on there. And then there's photolithography also. Um, Karen's asking, how would you add a color? So instead of um, on, the, on the ink slab there behind Essie, on the glass, that's all um, black ink, but you would just put a colored ink there instead, and then roll it up, you know, so if you had red, you would put out red ink and then roll it up on a, with a roller and then it would all be red. And so wherever the drawing was, it would, um, it would just pick it up in red instead of the, the black that it's picking up now. All right, so Essie's going to good paper. So she, she liked the way that it looked on the, on the newsprint. And so she's tightening the pressure because you do want, you know, it's harder to make a good print on good paper than it is on newsprint. So she's making the pressure a little bit stronger and adding some more grease. And then bringing the press bed in engaging the press, and lining it up, and then bringing down the bar to bring the scraper bar down and cranking it through. And then she has to lift up the pressure. <laughs> and move the grease back to the front. All right, that's great. Yeah, and now, and that's how 
That's how stone lithography works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so then she would just keep repeating this process oh right the finger the fingerprint came up yeah so that was just from her pressing her fingerprint onto the onto the stone because the grease from your hand can transfer into the stone and it clogs the stone with the grease in that area and then it can be rolled up in ink I see someone says you're amazing. And thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the ink needs time to dry then. So it will, um, it usually it dries in about three to five days or so. So if, does anyone have any other questions? It looks like um, Essie's gonna continue to print. So if there are any more questions about the process or um, any more questions about color or color runs, go ahead and please feel free to put your questions in the chat for Justin. Oh, um, so we have classes, stone lithography, um, and you can make prints like this um, as two weekend um, for two weeks. So it ends up being four classes all day with um, Devraj de Kochi. We'll probably be scheduling um, after May. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Elsie. All right, so we have some questions in the chat. Um, Ron is saying, when I see a run of 250 copies, this is the process for each print. Um, if, it's a, if it's a stone lithograph, then yes. Um, you know, you can also use photo plates, which you can print on these presses as well, but there's also, you know, newer forms of lithography like newspapers are also printed as lithographs um, on like large offset presses. So it's essentially the same process, but this is like hand, hand printed lithography as opposed to a mechanized press, like an offset press. Um, that's the same process, but the machine inks for you and rolls for you and whatnot. Um, but if it's a, a stone lithograph, then it, then it was printed like this, um, this process for each print, yes. So sponged and rolled up, you know, at least four or five times till it has the right amount of ink and then um, run through the press. Um, so JD said, how expensive are the various materials? Um, the, let's see, the stones, you, I think you can, I mean, if you purchase a stone, then it could be, you know, anywhere from like 200 to, a thousand dollars or something um and then the inks you know like twenty dollars or something like that but these stones here are stones that we can you can rent um in the workshop and so you know it's we've been um you know robert blackburn wanted to make sure that people had access to printmaking facilities um because the presses are very expensive and so that's why like our print shop exists because then um, people can just rent the stones for $10 a month um, and draw on the stones. So these are like our class stones. We also have classes in lithography. Um, but then people can use the studio for like less than $2 an hour with the, um, yeah, so we're looking through some different um, lithographs of members in the studio. Um, but yeah, so our, our membership is $35 for the year and then it's less than $2 a month. Uh, I'm sorry, $2 an hour to use the studio. And there's our picture of Robert Blackburn there in the studio. Um, and our prices haven't changed since Robert Blackburn's initial workshop in um, 1998. Um, yeah. 
let's see. But yeah, like the drawing materials, like the pencils are fairly inexpensive. Uh, maybe they're five dollars for a pencil, a drawing pencil, or the with a pencil. Um, so somebody else asked Jackie asked, how do you add a second color in just parts of it? So you would need you would need a second stone or or another or a plate, and then um, you know like if Essie wanted to make the the inside of the bottle a color, then she would need to transfer this image onto um, a mylar that she could use as a registration, and then um, use that as a guide. So, so the then just draw only like in the bottle area. Um, with the drawing material, and then that could be, um, you know, that would be etched onto a second plate. So the piece of paper would have to be printed um, from from this stone to get the detail that's in black, and then have another stone or plate set up that just has drawing material um, in, like inside of the the inside of the vase that would then be inked in red and printed in the exact same place. So registration is a huge part of um, printmaking also, you have to make sure that, you know, there's different ways that we have of registering the paper so that all the, um, the detail prints in the, in the place where it's supposed to. So, you know, if Essie wanted to add a second color to this, then she would have to put it on another, um, another stone or plate. All right, looks good. Um, yeah, so we got the registration exact there's different ways of like making, um, you know, crosshairs on the paper, or there's hole punch registration where you punch the paper and the plates. So you can see, um, you know, the difference between printing it on the newsprint or the good paper. And the idea is just to, you know, every time, like if we're creating an edition, you would have one print that the artist approves. And then every time you print a new one, you lay it down next to that print. And you say, is this part of the edition or not? You know, is it is it, um, does it have all the detail that we're looking for? Is it too light? Is it too dark? And then you would adjust, you would go back to the ink slab and adjust what you needed to do. Um, Elizabeth asked, were printmakers collaborators with artists like Bearden, or well, yeah, were printmakers collaborators with artists like Bearden or more like laborers? Um, I think, you know, I think it probably, went back and forth. Like I think that there are some um, some printers where they would just be given um, an image to print and it would be more like labor. But then I think in you know Robert Blackburn's um, case, like he was showing Bearden what he could do on the plates. And so it was a much more collaborative process and he had a lot more input than um, you know what would have happened maybe in later years. And so somebody said, let's see. Um, somebody asks, uh, Andy asks, if you wanted to make one or two of the flowers red, how would you make the next stone line up exactly on the top of the area? Um, yeah, so we have different methods of registration. Um, if you wanted to put that on another stone, you would you could either use like a transfer paper, you know, you're probably probably the easiest way would be to print this on a mylar, which is like a clear film of plastic. And you would have some kind of registration marks, either like center lines um, or a hole punch. And then you would lay that over a second stone and use a transfer paper. So that's, a, it looks like that's an example of some transfer paper. Uh, oh no, we're we doing chinkole. All right, Essie's going to do some chinkole. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so you would do, um, you would transfer it onto another stone and then you would draw in that, those areas. Um, so now Essie's going to use um, some Japanese paper that has glue on it to do um, chinkole. And so this is, a, this is an added bonus. Now you're, you're getting another demonstration. Um, so chinkole is a printmaking collage process where um, you put apply glue to thinner areas or, or sorry thinner um, thinner papers and then you can place them down on the ink stone um, so this is another way of applying color 
um, that where you don't have to have a second stone, you can actually use um, thinner printmaking paper that has the glue applied to it. And then Essie is gonna probably wet the paper um, on the next time, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so she had the paper in, um, in the water, the sink over there to make it wet um, because the moisture in the paper will reactivate the glue that's on the back of the, um, the Asian paper and then stick the, so it'll print, you know, you can see as she lays the paper down there, um, when she runs it through the press, it's gonna print the litho onto the um, thin red paper and the white backing sheet at the same time, but then the wet paper is gonna reactivate the glue and also stick down the thinner red paper to the back of the white paper. And so now she's running it through again. So, you know, as printmakers, we have a lot of different tricks for other techniques. Um, this is just scraping the surface right now. So now when she pulls the print off, that um, thin red paper with the glue is stuck down to the backing sheet and printed on top of um, with the litho. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> um, Karen is asking, would an artist ever add color by painting right on the print to produce a one color or one print in color? Um, yeah, you can draw on, you can draw on the prints if you want to. I mean, there's some purists that would say you should do it in print, but you know, why not make some hand painted prints? Um, yeah, so then Essie's got, made a nice addition here, um, doing some experimentation with the machine collet to add some red. And then uh, Gwendolyn is asking, if you wish to remove any undesired error in the print, is that possible? Um, at this point, it is possible, but it's difficult um, because what you would have to do is remove the gum Arabic layer um, with a counter etch. So you would need to use acid to remove the gum Arabic that's on the stone. Um, and then you could go back into the stone with either a snake slip stone, which is like, it looks like a piece of chalk where you would actually um, grind away or the the greasy drawing material and the grease reservoir from the stone and then you would have to re-etch it. Um, so you would have to remove, you know, you do a counter etch to remove the gum arabic film that's on the stone and then um, you can draw back into it at that point or you can delete it. Um, you can also use a very strong acid to burn away the, the grease from the stone. All right. So, Justin, there was a question about ventilation. I think that question got a little buried. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, the ventilation in the studio. Um, so we have, there's ventilation ports that run through the whole studio. Um, I don't know is it, if anybody is at, the, uh, is at the phone now and they can hear me, you can show us some of the ventilation ports. Um, but we basically have like a ventilation ports, port over every press. And um, yeah, so that's one of them for the litho press. Um, so whenever we're using solvents, it, um, you know, there's, there's booster fans and basically they connect to a, a large fan on the roof. Um, so there's, you know, every ink slab has ventilation on it, which we've improved um, since COVID too. So we had to, you know, make sure that we've made it, um, you know, the ventilation better. Uh, but at every ink slab, there's a ventilation um, port that is hooked up to, so that's, that's another one on the end of the slab here. And so that's hooked up to a gigantic fan on the roof that <laughs> draws all of the air out. Um, so they had to make the vents go, you know, cause the Elizabeth Foundation building is 
um, 12 stories. And so they couldn't vent out, you know, at the second floor where we are, because then it would be toxic fumes going in people's windows. So they had to run the ventilation all the way up to the roof and vent it out um, at the 12th floor. Um, yeah, so it's basically a, a gigantic fan sucking all the air out of the print shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay right. well, i don't see any other questions um so thank you so much justin for that step-by-step -step, really um great explanation of the whole process and essie thank you for your beautiful artwork your flower came out really nice and i love the uh shinkole i love the red added to that and um your ability to mime was really very good <laughs> during, <laughs> during the whole process. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate this. And I think, as you can see in the comments, everyone seems like they were really engaged and, and, uh, and appreciative for the time that you gave us. So thank you. Thank you very much also for me. I was really, I think, really helpful to a lot of people, especially if they were on our past sessions where we talked about printmaking. But to really see how involved it is, I think you can really appreciate Bearden's work even more mm -hmm. when you see those multiple color, multiple a uh, stone or block prints that yeah that he would have to have done. So, Great. yes, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Um, Justin, when you guys are done, I just have to pop back on to share one screen, unless there's anything else that you want to add. I don't want to, uh, cut into your time. <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think that's it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. And, and we hope to work with you guys again. This is really, really terrific. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. So... Okay, so um, just to reconnect uh, with our program, next week we have um, our fourth session, which is a virtual family art activity, and it's creating personal narrative through collage. So what's really nice about this program is it's for all ages. Um, so if you have younger people in your family or you want to do this yourself, we invite you to come. It is during, for some of you, it's during February recess. So you might have uh, younger kids home from school that are looking for something to do or you're looking for something to do. We have a list of supplies here and the flyer is also in our chat. So you can also get it there. Um, so, you know, during the week, if you want to collect some of these supplies, so when you log on, you can follow along. We will have a step-by-step -step process on how to do this, and then we'll always have a Q&A. And then the, the video will also be posted, so you can kind of go back and then, you know, redo it maybe over the weekend or on your own time. So um, we hope to see you again next week for that. And on. Of course, if you have, you know, any questions or you want to, again, you want to go back and view that first session, if you missed it, visit our website and there is the link and the first session is recorded on our calendar of events page. And if you don't already, please follow us on social media. It's a great way to kind of stay, you know, in step with everything that we do and all the exhibitions that we have um, for the spring semester. So thank you, everyone. I think there were questions. Did I see questions in there that popped up? They were, they were mostly thank yous. Oh, okay. Excellent. Every, yeah, everybody seemed to really enjoy it. I, I think it's really helpful since we talked, especially last week, about the different printmaking mediums to actually see how the lithograph was made. I think really answers probably a lot of people's questions about the process. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, especially with some of Bearden's, with the multiple colored prints that he did, you know, just the amount of process. Yes, oh, the info, most, yes, let me, oh, oh, just, say, just, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Karen, I agree. No, I was just gonna say, the, the link to the workshop is in the chat. Is that what somebody was looking for? Yes, and, and here's yeah. the address of the, I'm sorry that I don't have, the, oh, the link is in the chat, but here's the yeah. address. Yeah. Um, for the workshop. Yeah. Yes, Delinda, 
You're welcome. <laughs> we'll do our best. We'll do, we do our best, most definitely. So yeah, thank you. Thank you again all for attending. And um, we look forward to seeing you all next week. So have a great weekend, everyone. Bye, Essie. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys.